History is full of colourful characters who have become household names, but there is one of whom very few have heard about. This is the history of the man who tried to steal the crown jewels of England, Thomas Blood. Thomas Blood was most likely born in County Clare in Ireland, the son of a successful landowning blacksmith of English descent. He grew up in Sarney in County Meath and received his education in Lancashire, England. At the age of 20, he married Maria Holcroft, the daughter of John Holcroft of Holcroft Hall in Cheshire. He then returned to Ireland. Blood returned to England at the outbreak of the First English Civil War in 1642 and initially took up arms with the Royalist forces law to Charles I. As the conflict progressed, he switched sides and became a lieutenant in Oliver Cromwell's roundheads. In 1653, at the cessation of hostilities, Cromwell awarded Blood land grants as payment for his service and appointed him a Justice of the Peace. Following the restoration of King Charles II to the crowns of the Three Kingdoms in 1660, Blood fled with his family to Ireland. The confiscations and repayments under the Act of Settlement 1662 brought Blood to financial ruin, and in return Blood sought to unite his fellow Cromwellians in Ireland to cause insurrection. Blood conspired to storm Dublin Castle, usurp the government and kidnap the first Duke of Ormond, who was Lord Lieutenant of Ireland for ransom. On the eve of the attempt, the plot was foiled. Blood managed to evade the authorities by hiding with his countrymen in the mountains, and ultimately managed to escape to the United Dutch province in the Low Country. A few of Blood's collaborators were captured and executed. In 1670, despite his status as a wanted man, Blood returned to England and is believed to have taken the name Eowulf and practised as a doctor in Romford Market, east of London. A second attempt on the life of the Duke of Ormond followed but was unsuccessful, and Blood once again went into hiding. But Blood was not to remain hidden for long, as another plot began to form in his mind. This time, he would steal the crown jewels. In April or May 1671, Blood visited the Tower of London dressed as a priest, and accompanied by a female companion pretending to be his wife. In those days, the crown jewels could be viewed by the payment of a fee to the custodian. While viewing the crown jewels, Blood's wife pretended a stomach complaint and begged the newly appointed master of the jewel house, the 77-year-old Talbot Edwards, to fetch her some spirits. Given the closeness of the jewel keeper's domestic quarters to the site, Edward's wife invited them upstairs to their apartment to recover, after which Blood and his wife thanked the Edwards and left. Over the following days, Blood frequently returned to the tower to visit the Edwards, and presented Mrs Edwards with four pairs of white gloves as a gesture of thanks. As Blood became familiar with the family, an offer was made for a fabricated nephew of Blood's to marry the Edwards' daughter, who, Blood alleged, would be eligible by virtue of the marriage to an income of several hundred pounds. On the 9th of May 1671, in continuance of his deception, Blood persuaded Edwards to show the jewels to him, his supposed nephew and two of his friends while they waited for a dinner that Mrs Edwards was to put on for Blood and his companions. The jewel keeper's apartment was in Martin Tower above the basement where the jewels were kept behind a metal grill. Blood's accomplices carried canes that concealed rapier blades, daggers and pocket pistols in entering the jewel house, one of the men made a pretense of standing watch outside, while the others joined Edwards and Blood. The door was then closed, and a cloak thrown over Edwards, who was struck with a mallet, knocked to the floor, bound, gagged, and stabbed to subdue him. After removing the grill, Blood used his mallet to flatten St. Edward's crown, so that he could hide it beneath his clerical coat. Another conspirator, Blood's brother-in-law Hunt, filed the sepulchre with the cross in two, while the third man, Parrot, stuffed the sovereign's orb down his breeches. Meanwhile, 
Edwards refused to stay subdued and fought against his bindings. Accounts vary as to whether Edwards' struggle caused sufficient disturbance to raise the alarm or whether the attempt was foiled by a more fortunate circumstance. Edward's son, after hearing the commotion, went to investigate, and at the door of the jewel house he was met by Blood's guard who challenged him, before the young Edwards entered and went upstairs. The guard then alerted his fellow gang members, at around the same time, the elder Edwards managed to free his gag and raise the alarm, shouting, Treason! Murder! The crown is stolen. As Blood and his gang fled to their horses waiting at St. Catherine's Gate, they dropped the sepulchre and fired on the guards who attempted to stop them. One drawbridge guard was struck with fear and failed to discharge his musket. As they ran along the tower wharf, it is said that they joined the calls for alarm to confuse the guards until they were chased down by the Captain Beckman, brother-in-law of the younger Edwards. Although Blood shot at him, he missed and was captured before reaching the Iron Gate. Having fallen from his cloak, the crown was found while Blood refused to give it up, struggling with his captors and declaring, It was a gallant attempt, however unsuccessful. It was for a crown. The globe and orb were recovered, although several stones were missing, and others were loose. Hunt and Parrot were also taken, but not punished. Blood, when interrogated, refused to answer to anyone but the king, and was consequently taken to the palace in chains, where he was questioned by King Charles, Prince Rupert, and others. King Charles asked Blood, What if I should give you your life? And Blood replied, I would endeavour to deserve it, sire. Much to the disgust of the Duke of Ormond, Blood was not only pardoned, but was also given land in Ireland worth five hundred pounds a year. In contrast, Edward's family was awarded less than three hundred pounds by the king, a sum which was never paid in full, and he returned to his duties at the tower, regaling visitors with his tales of the attempted theft. The reason for the king's pardon are unknown, though it may have been through fear of sparking an uprising in revenge by followers of blood. Others speculate that the king had a fondness for scoundrels such as blood, and that he was amused by the Irishman's claim that the jewels were worth only £6,000, as opposed to the £100,000 at which the crown had valued them. Following his pardon, Blood became a familiar figure around London and made frequent appearances at court, where he was employed to advocate in the claim of suitors to the crown. In John Wilmot, 2nd Earl of Rochester's History of Insipids, he wrote of Blood, blood that wears treason in his face, filling complete in parson's gown, how much he is at court in grace for stealing almond and the crown, since loyalty does no man good, let steal the king and outdo blood. After a dispute with the Duke of Buckingham in 1679, blood was once again imprisoned. He was released from prison in July 1680, but had fallen into a coma by the 22nd of August. Thomas Blood died on the 24th of August at his home in Bowling Alley, Westminster. His body was buried in the churchyard of St Margaret's Church, now Christ Church Gardens, near St James's Park. <laughs>